This week in history, we take you back to 2007. Apple have just released the very first iPhone. England thumped by Australia 5-0 in the ashes. Barney halts Taylor in the final of the world darts. And a young trainer called Gordon Elliott is about to win the Grand National with Silver Birch. Ruby by the Kaiser Chiefs, soon to be number one. And that song would reverberate around Cheltenham in March and for many years to come. Jockey Ruby Walsh, the link to the star of this week. The one, the only, Cotto star. It's Cotto star in front, Cotto star steals the show and wins the Gold Cup. And Cotto star is over from Denman in second, Exotic Dancer and Neptune Colange. Cotto star makes history, the first horse to regain the Tote Sport Cheltenham Gold Cup. And Cotto star, what a comeback here at Haydock. He's going to win his fourth bet fair chase. Chaser of a lifetime, Cordo Star is in front, long runs closing, but Cordo Star has done it, he's won five King Georges. During the 2006-2007 season, Cotto Star was simply irresistible, almost unplayable. But his first two campaigns in Britain had been exciting, but dramatic and eventful, with jockey Ruby Walsh at the heart of it all. Well, his first run, I suppose, was... Uh... I wouldn't call it dramatic, but it was dramatic in what was about to come. I mean, it was a hell of a performance. He beat Foreman and Lockspit in a beginner's chase or a novice chase in Newbury just before the turn of the year, and it was how he did it. It was such a performance. Then obviously he went to Exeter, fell at the, uh, I think it was the second last, maybe it was the third last, second last, I think it was. Um, I duly rushed around and jumped back on him and failed to get back up, and he got beaten ahead. And then he was out for a considerable period of time. He came back, ran in the Holland Gold Cup, ran OK. Then I got injured. Fitzy won the Tingle Creek on him. He was very good. And then I rode him in the champion chase where he fell at the at the fort. And Moscow Flyer kicked me halfway down the track. So um, I guess his first two years, only five runs in the first two seasons. But uh, I guess it was only a taste of what was to come. I remember the first time I saw Corto Star very well indeed, and it was at a meeting, a Newbury meeting, where we were covering some racing on Channel 4, and the previous race, the one before we went on air, was a novice's chase, and this horse, Corto Star, who I think we knew had cost a lot of money, was running in it, and I don't think he was unexpected or anything like that, but um, he was very impressive and it just hit you right between the eyes. And after the race, immediately after the race, we were all on the buzzer. We've all got buttons to go back to the, the scanner. And I immediately keyed through to my producer, Andrew Franklin, and I said, that's a good horse. That, that has to be a good horse. Johnny Frankham did the same. John, we were all saying on the team that just, just was something a bit different. And so it proved, and, uh, but, you, but this is often the case, you know, you see a horse just very occasionally, you just know, if you had a lot of experience of watching races, you just know when you've seen something a little bit out of the ordinary. I should not know what we were thinking when he headed into that 06 or 07 season. Um, he definitely hadn't fulfilled the potential that we thought he had, and it was a bit of a crossroads. Did I think at that stage that he was going to be the horse he was, multiple King George winner, Gold Cup winner? I, I didn't really have a clue. He stepped up in trip to win the old Roan, where he absolutely hosed up. But I do remember going to Haydock quite clearly to ride him in the Betfair chase and thinking, like, if this fella stays three miles, he's the real deal. And he absolutely bolted up. He won on the bridle. And then Paul rang a couple of weeks later, maybe a fortnight later, wondering would he drop him back to the Tingle Creek. And I was thinking, Jesus, no, he can't do that. And then I rang him back and said, well, why not? I mean, he'd had two seasons, only had five runs. To me, he wasn't, hadn't proved how sound a horse he was. Um, he was a tough horse, but he hadn't proved how sound a horse he was, so I was thinking we might as well make hay while the sun was shining. It's a bit of a mad decision, really. We obviously um, started off winning the old round, then we stepped up to three miles and won the Betfair chase. And then I was just studying the entries on the Monday before the Tingle Creek, and there weren't too many in it. I rang Ruby up and said, I got a feeling we should be going in the Tingle Creek on the weekend. And he said, oh, it took me two years to settle him, don't be so stupid, and put the phone down. I know Clive was quite keen to run him and enter him, so two minutes later, Ruby's back on the front. He said,
it. We might all be dead next week running. So we entered him, and um, the rest is history, really. But yeah, he was a talented horse, and he had enough speed for two, but actually could stay three and a quarter miles. There weren't many like that. Um, and I was quietly confident he'd win the Tingle Creek because he was probably the best horse around, and he, he duly did. He hosed up in the Tingle Creek, beat Viper Steadies, then went and won the King George, headed on to the Aeon Chase, where he was probably lucky enough to beat, I think it was Lamy, and uh, then all roads led to the Gold Cup. Well, we, we gave him quite a nice break, and then he ran at Newbury in his trial race, just about scraped home, but we'd left a lot to work on, um, and then he improved from Newbury massively to the Gold Cup, and I'd probably say when he won that Gold Cup that first time in 2007, was probably as good as he was. I guess I always felt he'd stay, but sure, nobody knows. And um, look, it was a big field goal cup. There were 17 runners, but there was no real pace in it. So I was thinking, like, these probably aren't going to go as fast as they could, could do in a goal cup. Um, I knew I was riding the fastest horse, but I didn't know if he'd stay. He was obviously going for the, the Betfair bonus at the time as well. And like, the goal cup is the goal cup. I mean, it's the pinnacle of any season. So I, I was hopeful. I can't say I was confident he was going to get three and a quarter, but I was hopeful that he would. He'd gotten it well at Haydock. Obviously, we know getting three miles at Kempton doesn't, has very little relevance in, in getting the trip in the Gold Cup. We saw that with Florida Pearl, one man, un, oh, loads of horses. Um, but I was hopeful he'd stay. But until you try, you never know. And I suppose, at least with Paul Nichols, you were always going to... He was always going to throw the dart and see what happened. Well, I'm not sure he truly did stay. You know, in the record book, it says he won the Gold Cup. He probably won the Gold Cup just on his class. He probably was better at a shorter distance. But he just had enough ability to be able to counter around and then managed to you know, quicken up over those last two fences up over the hill. So he was one of those, as I said earlier, I mean, he was a two-mile horse, really. They could get three and a quarter. He could probably win over any distance. It was a big field goal cup, but there was no massive front runner. Stay to play had been a really good winner at the Hennessy for Evan Williams and Paul Maloney, and I knew Paul would sit him sort of fifth, sixth down the inside, and I thought he was a good benchmark. I reckoned if I could get behind Stay to play, Caught always went a bit left. I had to get him to settle. If I sat him in down the inside behind Stay to play, I'd sort of be halfway, and and that'd do me. Now I didn't think that Stay to play would end up halfway which meant that me being behind him meant I was pretty much towards the back with only AP behind me on Exotic Dancer but again we, we didn't go quick and I was thinking to myself at halfway like I'm riding the only horse in this race that'll win at Tingle Creek um, so the slower they were going the better it was suiting me uh, top of the hill huge amount of horses still in with a chance and I was towards the inside down the tree out thinking am I going to get a run? And I could see Tony Dobbin going around the outside and Turpin Green, and I was thinking, well, he's not going to leave much room inside. So I switched out um, and went after Tony Dobbin. There was a few gaps inside. AP got them on Exotic Dancer, so I had to roll over and, and, and close a few doors. But he pinged the second last. wasn't great at the last, but I knew when he landed, he had the momentum to get all the way to the line, and he wasn't going to stop. A little bit of a trademark, less so later on in his career, a trademark in his early forays in, in Britain was this, this habit of putting down at the final fence. I think he did put in a little bit of a <laughs> fluff at the last. It just happened so quick that I didn't even think much about it. He got in a bit deep, he hit it halfway up, but he was very good at getting his feet out. And um, you know, I suppose when you're watching those things, as I see now, mistakes seem to take forever. But when you're on a horse's back, it just seems to be an instant and uh, the mistake. I don't know, I guess he just hit it, feet were out. And I knew he wasn't going to fall over. I was just hoping I wouldn't fall off him. Carlos Starr's career was incredible. Five King Georges, a couple of Gold Cups, two Tingle Creeks, Bedfair chases, uh, champion chases in Down Royal. He was just, he had everything and he wasn't, he wasn't unbeatable. He got beaten a few times, he got a few crunch and falls but he always seemed to come back he was just he was an incredible racehorse he was so sound resilient um, he had speed stamina he was just he had everything I think but it was his soundness and it was his ability to keep coming back year after year his longevity to me he was just a perfect racehorse
It's Neptune Collange then from Forget the Past, State of Play the Listener. Turpin Green in the white sleeves towards the outside, stalked by Quarto Star. Then Exotic Dancer still improving from Munker Hostin and My Will as they jump the third last in the Gold Cup. Neptune Collange led the way just. He led, but there's plenty of potential challengers. Forget the past. State of Play is in there fighting. The Listener, there's not much room. Turpin Green, Exotic Dancer up the inside. Ruby's now pulled Quarto Star out wider, the white face favourite, as they swing for home. They've got two fences left to jump. Neptune Collange and Turpin Green. Here comes Quarto Star towards the outside. Exotic Dancer comes through with State of Play as well as they go to the second last. And Quarto Star jumps to the lead. He quickened up beautifully there and now kicks away from Exotic Dancer between the final two fences. Quarto Star, the final fence. The racing world holds its breath. Oh, he brushed through it. He got away with it. Exotic Dancer, four or five legs down in second. Then Turpid Green. Quarto Star from Exotic Dancer up the hill. Quarto Star chased by Exotic Dancer from Turpin Green. It's Quarto Star in front. Quarto Star steals the show and wins the Gold Cup. Watch live racing now on RacingTV.com.